Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Donnybrook. Great to have you with us. And we have a fantastic program, including a special guest on Next Up when we say hello to Dr. Mano Patri, who is the infectious disease specialist for SSM Health. That'll be on the second half of the program. Lots of hot topics to discuss on this, the first half. And we'll, we'll, we will discuss those with Wendy Weiss, the news director for the Big 550 KTRS and co-host of the Jennifer and Wendy Show. Mr. Bill McClellan, one of our founders from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Another founder, he's Ray Hartman, who joins us from the Big 550, rawstory.com, and the Riverfront Times. We also welcome Mr. Alvin Reed, news editor for the St. Louis American. And Alvin, we'll kick things off with you because Hazel Irby, longtime member of the St. Louis County Council, uh, passed away after last week's show. Um, since we were on the air last, and she was credited by official after official for her professionalism and her dedication. A big loss, a huge loss to the political scene. Well, absolutely. And, you know, if, if you're the first of anything, you know, that's that's important. But she carried her role with dignity and class. It was a, a first rate politician. Um, you know, the last the, the rigmarole in the last two years and the, and the lawsuits, I guess that's part of it, too. But um Every every kind word she received, she deserved, and uh, just just a just a first class person all the way around. It was interesting to see how many people used uh, were either the word or some other word to connote mentor in talking to her. She was somebody very wise and somebody who people, a lot of people came to and and viewed um, with great reverence, and I, I she will be missed. I think nice. those of those of us in the fourth estate always appreciated her availability. She was she was always making herself available when a lot of leaders today are are not always keen to do so. And I think a nice tribute to Hazel Irby would be if the St. Louis County Council followed up on its plans made two years and three months ago to construct a North County Recreation Center for the youth there. That was an idea she had. She left the council, and the idea seemed to have dropped out of, uh, you know, off, off the side of the earth. And maybe now that idea will come back. Let's hope so. All right, Bill McClellan, um, next door to where you used to work, 900 North Tucker, that's now uh, going to be the new St. Louis headquarters for Square, which is the uh, mobile payments company headed up by two St. Louisans, Jack Dorsey and Jim McKelvey. Turns out that they're is a homeless encampment next to it. Now, homeless encampments are not that unusual in St. Louis, St. Louis's downtown. There was one there uh, earlier this year across from City Hall that didn't seem to get much of any attention, but this one seems to really have caused some alarm. What do you think? Is it just because it's next to Square and that's kind of embarrassing to local officials? Well, I suppose so, because Square is going to uh you know, lead us into the new technology age, and it's wonderful that Square is here. But but I, I don't find a homeless encampment next to Square such an awful thing at all, because it's also next to St. Patrick's, where the homeless get a lot of services. And I, I think that the homeless encampments downtown make more sense than in some residential neighborhoods. I mean, uh, you know, like I live, you know, a block from Forest Park, and I wouldn't want to see homeless encampments in Forest Park. But downtown, I, I think that the city is overreacting. I would agree. Um, but I will say that, you know, we, we we all talk a good game. But if somebody said, like, hey, you know, Alvin, your neighborhood, you know, I, I'd say, like, oh, no, can't we find some place else for it to go? And I'm not picking on, you know, Dorsey and McKelvey because I think all corporate America could step up. But, I mean, those two gentlemen made enough money today, probably in the last hour, to, to build an apartment and complex for homeless people with heat and running water 
and probably provide it with food. So, um, you know, r rather than keep ushering homeless people around the city, or you could be here now, but you can't be here now because Square is coming and all that. How about we come up with a, a solution for it? And, you know, there are plenty of pu public and private entities that can pay for it. Well, I, you know, I, I'm not blaming anything on Jim McKelvey, and I think that he really has stepped up for St. Louis to, to locate a major office of Square in, in St. Louis, and the downtown restaurants are, I'm sure, beside themselves waiting for all these young people to come in. But, but I don't think the young people who work at Square would be that turned off by the homeless encampments. Certainly there I, when the Post-Dispatch was there, and, and, I, and we weren't upset. And that's a great point, Bill. I mean, I really do think so. And and the fact that Mr. McKelvey's partner was so quick to say that even the develop the, the, the developers are going to be engaged in this situation and doing everything they can do, I don't think it's a matter of prioritizing or level of importance i just think that this is a very high profile high tech company that's really important for st louis and they're trying to get out in front they being city hall they're just trying to get out in front for other potential high tech employees there's a lot of attention on us right now i don't think it should be a litmus test about who wants it by in their neighborhood doesn't i think it's a very illogical place to have this first of all the real strategy that needs to happen for unhoused or homeless people is to do something about their needs and about permanent housing. That's got to be the bigger. That's all I was saying. But that's the first thing. The second thing is you want to have, you got to take care of both parties. I don't disagree at all with Bill about the residentials, but you need to take care of the needs of the unhoused folks, the folks so that they can get to essential services, but you also have to be practical about it. And the last thing any city needs to be doing is trying to get businesses like Square, doesn't matter what business they're in or how much money they have, to come and locate. There are very, it's a wonderful get for St. Louis to have Square and McKelvey in the old post dispatch building, uh, 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 Square, uh, I'm sorry, Square. And it's a very illogical place for a community to put that encampment buy some place that they and it, it doesn't reflect on the folks that right, it's right next to st patrick's great right? it has all the services but it's it, it is right next to st patrick's you know and also i will say uh, square has already announced that its employees can work from home forever they're never going to be required to come down to 900 north tucker so i don't know how many will be disturbed or even noticing that there are homeless next door to their business but also while you're at it between uh, Tucker and the Stan the Man Bridge, there's a lot of litter on Tucker. And uh, I, I think there, that there uh, are, uh, if the city really city. wants to impress Square, they could uh, start <laughs> picking up some of the litter in downtown St. Louis. But this, in, the, the homeless issue also was in an aldermanic committee hearing yesterday. And this was a subcommittee of the Board of Aldermen, which uh, voted on the, the money that's coming from the federal government, which was last week $517 million. Now, we're told by city officials it's only $498 million, but that's a lot of money by St. Louis standards, especially when you consider the city's annual budget is $1.1 billion. The big question is, how will the money be spent? And Ray Hartman, Louis Reed, the president of the Board of Aldermen, has reinstated $5 million for police overtime. Mayor Tashara Jones took that out earlier this year, so there's a little conflict there. Also, he has cut, uh, this committee has cut direct payments to individuals, uh, low-income individuals. They might have been getting three to $500 in stipends. And Lewis Reed has said, the president of the Board of Aldermen, and apparently the aldermanic panel agrees, that money should go elsewhere. And this is interesting, I think. Ten wards have so far voted that they do not want the mayor's intentional encampments at all, not in their wards. This is both the North and South St. Louis. The aldermen there stuck into the measure that they don't want these, these camps that the mayor is designing with counseling and heat and water and electricity and all that kind of stuff. They do not want them. What are some of your reactions? There's a lot of ground there. I, I there think is too I'll much. Take, Sorry. I, no, I'm just saying, I'll take the, <clears throat> first of all, the, if you know anybody, I've talked to some aldermen today, uh, people members of the Board of Aldermen, and 
The processes are so arcane at the Board of Aldermen that they don't even understand them in terms of where the bill's gonna, what a bill's coming out of committee. There's this, I think it's board bill two that has stuff, whether there's a question of whether it's gonna go to the mayor, go to the ENA. Bottom line is this. I think Tashara Jones had a really good idea about giving direct support. The money is definitely earmarked for that kind of thing. It would have a very stimulative effect for the economy, for lower income people to get $500, particularly in a state that cut off so many people on the unemployment. It's a really smart thing to do. It's unfortunate it's become political with Lewis and I don't know why it shouldn't have because it's a good idea. People with lower income spend money in the city it, it multiplies. It's just a great idea for so many people that are suffering, having trouble paying their rent, their food, their utilities. It was a great idea. I don't think it's going to happen now. As far as police overtime, it's a ridiculous argument. Overtime is not something you really budget for in this. You have a budget for it, but arguing about how much it's going to be, it all depends on what's going on. So last year, I think they spent, they budgeted 12 million and spent 16. Because why? Because of the George Floyd protests and they had all these needs. Most years, the budget's been, I think, around six or seven million until for some reason they made it higher last year. You, the idea that you would put a number in there is if you got five million dollars, hire 70 police officers at 75 per. I mean, you don't have it as a fixed item. It doesn't make sense to just say we're gonna spend it on overtime. You, you spend it as you need it, and it depends on how many how many protests there are, how they many- can't, They can't fill the positions, right, Ray? That, that's not true. They have always, you know, they, they, there's this myth out there that they can't hire people. They, every year they have- No, a they're having trouble hiring people. Wendy's right on that, but no, this is don't. overtime. This money- Of 100 people- the Overtime was to offset the, the, the lack of, of the, officers. The lack of police officers. Right. You're right. And not, last I'm weekend, we had five kids killed in off. one 24-hour period we need more police officers on the street. Then that, that cannot be refuted. Not pay more overtime. I, I agree with you. If they need more, they can hire them. They 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 taking this money and paying overtime to people instead of hiring officers with the same money. And overtime depends on the the particular year. They shouldn't need. Well, Ray, the, the, the it's the police. It's the. Uh, Public safety director Jimmy Edwards, the former one, who who said they have a hard time hiring people, and and so they needed overtime. I mean, I, I don't I don't know if, if you're Dan right, Eisen. they're all wrong. He's been replaced by Dan Isom. We haven't heard from him on that. It would be interesting to see if Dan Isom has that view because what Jimmy Edwards thought, respectfully isn't what matters going forward. No, well, it's, it's true. The, 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 the city's always been about, in the last 10 years, 200 officers short of a full complement. And what happens is a lot of the officers are heading to St. Charles, Chesterfield, Clayton just hired one or two. And that's what's happening. I mean, th that can't be denied, not, not to mention the you know ordinary retirements. Uh, now, the mayor disagrees with that. She thinks that there are too many police officers. And Megan Green tweeted this week that basically you know, police work is not evidence-based. It doesn't show that it reduces crime, which I think is just uh, orbiting Saturn. No, I don't. I mean, but the point is this. I'm not saying they should hire more police officers. I'm saying fighting over a line item about overtime. If you really want to spend that money, I would see it's mm. spent on. I don't know. They, you know, I do think one thing that Tashara Jones says, and I think she's right, and the Democrats have to be careful because it's not about defunding the police, which is a ridiculously horrendous, maybe the worst slogan ever. There is the idea of a more comprehensive approach to crime that takes into the fact, account the fact that police alone cannot get us out of this problem. Right. If good, they would have. And so the idea of trying no. to have less crime by addressing its causes is a good one, and that's what Tashar is about. Well, but, but you can do both. You can you can add you money can to the overtime, so police officers will work the streets. Right now, there are not enough police officers on Washington Avenue, so they've turned to Vernon Betts, the sheriff, to hire them. You could do both. She's got four hundred ninety-eight million dollars. She could she could fund the homeless and the counselors and the social workers from the Brown School and all that that she wants to and hire police officers. There's what, no what need for think, her. I don't think do she's, call, I mean, well, I don't, we're, we're not sitting there looking at the numbers, but I do think that when she brought Dan in, and again, I don't want to make him build him up too much, 
he, he brought in probably the most credible person I know in this town, and, and I'm assuming well, that he's let me part just say of this. Team. Dan Isom is a very smart guy, but he's don't forget, first. he was the police chief, and this is when Christine Byers broke this story for the Post-Dispatch, what, 10, 12 years ago? Remember when all of a sudden people said, wow, car break-ins are way down. Yeah, well, Dan Isom changed the way they were counted. Because if 10 cars were broken into at one point, he counted that as one. But he never told anybody that he changed the method. So you got to keep an eye on all sure. officials, including... Okay. I don't know where this discussion went. So now we're trashing out Dan Isom, who doesn't have anything to do with it. I'm just saying, okay. keep your um, eye on I will just, I would say this. Please don't... You know, the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department has a lot of to do with why people don't want to join the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. And over the last three years, that that has been evident. So let's not just give the police department itself a pass on why people don't want to work for it, because it's an embarrassment a lot of times. And if I was going to work for a police department, that, that would not be one that I worked for. Well, and, and you're right, because the pay starts at 44. No, forget the pay. Talk I'm pay. not talking about no, no pay. Talk about pay. I'm talking, about, I'm talking pay. about beating up fellow officers. I'm talking about killing fellow officers while you're drunk and supposed to be on duty. It's on and on and on. And how many lawsuits has the police department paid off in the last five years? It's a damn sight more than $5 million, Charlie. Well, and I will also say, speaking of numbers, the starting pay is about $20,000 less than some of the and neighboring How about having Jeff Ward as your, your union your union business manager? There's a lot of things what Alvin's saying is right. In, you including cannot, me, including you can't media coverage. You in a vacuum like all police departments are created equal. I mean, they've got well, some... Well, then you, you also have uh, a circuit attorney who refuses to prosecute the cases. And that so doesn't have that anything well. to That's do with it. Do it. Well, I, I, it sure I mean, does. It sure uh, does. Ask, ask the police officer. Okay, all right, fine. They, yeah, because they're going wait, to St. Charles. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie is, does St. Louis have an exemplary police force compared to others around the United States of America? I would say that St. Louis's police department definitely has issues like every police department in the okay. United States. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, well, Alvin, let's move to Webster Groves, which is uh, your neighboring community you seem to live in peaceful coexistence with. Their parade this past week did have an anti-vax float. And I thought, wow, this is the 4th of July. A, a message like that, where's that coming from? But as it turns out, Officials said that, you know, that's there's only limit, limited things you can do when you have a um, publicly funded parade. How did you stand on this? Well, I was actually at Webster for part of the 4th of July. Of course, I did fireworks at Kirkwood, but went to a friend's house for a party that, that lived uh, near where the parade grounds are. Uh, you know, I think their hands are tied. And it's one of those things where rather than make a deal <laughs> bigger than it really is, I think Webster just basically decided, okay, maybe we were caught a little off guard by it, but it's over. Now, people started complaining and, and, and all that, and they're reacting to that, which I also kind of understand. But that Beverly Hillbillies looking float that they had should not even rank or anybody. I mean, it's just, it's a joke, just like the most of the anti-vax people are jokes. And I'd rather than get upset with it, laugh at it, because that's all I, that, that's basically how I see it. The, and, and what what I loved was the fact that so many people were up in arms about it on the 4th of July, <laughs> which, which is all about our freedoms, our rights, the Constitution, whether, you know, you agree or disagree with the message, we all have, as Americans have to defend to the death that person's right to to make the message public, so I I, th I thought the interesting thing was that the uh, the counter the the city hall representative who who talked to the newspaper said that you know the only the only uh, exception would be something that posed a threat to the public, and I thought one could argue that an anti-vax message does exactly that, but for the most part, I thought it was a freedom of speech issue, and you, you have to explain that to your kids. And, and you have to understand, too, that uh, according to the newspaper story, the, uh, well, the people who had the anti-vax float didn't uh, 
register it as an anti-vax float. I mean, it was a little more generic. And but 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 I'm with you as long as somebody's not hating on other people. I think for the Fourth of July and, and Webster Groves has always been good about you know uh, the NRA and Moms Against Guns and everybody who wants to can parade. And I think that's a, a good spirit of thing. I think the anti-vax message is really heinous, okay? I think it's bad. The First Amendment was designed to protect heinous speech, and that speech we don't like. And so if you have in place, if you're going to allow, it's a political message. If you're going to allow other political messages, I guess fine. Sure. I think the point, there's a couple points that need to be made, though, I, remade, I guess. One is if they misrepresented it, that's an entirely different issue. That doesn't become a first. If they there, you really can't allow people to say I'm going to do X and then they do Y I, it, if it's if it somehow affected policy. But the second thing is, uh, to Alvin's point, we're talking about it. The, the best thing to do with some is just ignore it, you know, because it's like doesn't deserve the attention it gets. And certainly if you're going to let other people make political, uh, I don't know that they have politicians or whatever, you're going to let people make Famous for that. statements. You can't regulate the government can't regulate what those messages are. But I do think we should emphasize how heinous it is in the middle of this pandemic to be, as so many are now, pushing back against vaccines. Well, and we're, we're the, Missouri's I, one of the worst states in America. CNN had a piece that identified five places that threaten the rest of the country because they're not with, with the potential um, uh, variants. Mm -hmm. Uh, that then we're not getting our arms and, and Mike Parson in particular not getting our arms around this problem. Well, we're right, you know, we've been we've been held up to ridicule since this whole thing began when when there was that party at Lake of the Ozarks. Yeah. I mean, it was party look at those very people. Party so COVID. so you know. Uh, Take that with a grain of salt. Well, I, I think it's very. I don't think anybody gets their medical information from a parade float. So there's that. <laughs> I agree with you, kind of Elvin, in that way. Don't pay much attention to it. But I, I would say, look, why not have a not for profit? Uh, we'll call it the Webster Groves Fourth of July uh, organization, 501c3, get donations, and they could operate it, uh, the parade, and that way they could, um, you know, buy the permit and then uh, maybe pay off the police officers or whatever they do, whoever guards uh, the parade route pay for whatever expenses, and then they could, uh, you know, limit the floats to the ones that are patriotic, that have something to do with Webster Groves, and uh, have nothing to do with Vax's pro or con. Oh, because it's going well the way it is, Charlie. It's a famous thing. The people in Webster Groves love it. I'd leave it alone. I would All say. Right. Hey, Wendy Weiss, would you leave alone, or would you uh, change the new law that allows Missourians to go to a bar or restaurant, order some food, and then take alcohol with them to go you have to you have to order food that's what the new law says it's actually an extension of the law that started during the pandemic and uh, the bottle of uh, booze or whatever you're buying the the cup has to be securely contained there has to be a lid fastened on it i guess so how do you feel about this legislation which now means alcohol to go is permanent in missouri well we have not we have not done that um, since the pandemic or since they uh, since they uh, enacted this uh, sort of little perk during the pandemic. But I think that when 110,000 restaurants around the nation went under, and I think so many restaurants right now in St. Louis are struggling uh, mightily to 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 get back up to previous levels of staff and weight people and that kind of thing anything that we can do to to help them i think we should i think we should do it and we do i would remind everybody on the panel even though they're the ones who probably <laughs> know this better than anybody we do have an open container law in missouri and so that to me if you've got an open container law um, and, and if we haven't had a noticeable uptick in any kind of to-go container incidents, then I, I think we ought to just leave it alone and do everything we can to help these, these businesses. I think it's just a bad idea, and somebody's going to get hurt, hopefully not killed, and they're going to they're gonna blame the law, and then we'll have this discussion again. Alvin, what and, is I mean, if you walk in and, and I, I need a kid's cheeseburger, and 
four margaritas. You like anything else? Yeah, straw. Oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. I, you know, I don't see the difference between this and going to Schnucks and ordering from the deli and grabbing a six pack or whatever, or a bottle of wine. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I get you probably, but it, it's still illegal to drink in your car, right? I well, but, but driving, but of course, but, but you, you can mean, have an open why container if, if somebody if else is driving. Okay. But if a restaurant wants to, like, let you buy a six-pack to go or something, or whatever, a bottle of wine or whatever it is, I don't know. This is like getting in Manhattan to go. Right? Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. No, if, look, if, if the you, bank... If you're if, responsible, I don't see... Uh, most people, you're, I don't inviting, know, you're inviting if trouble. If the bank didn't lock the vault at night, they be getting knocked over all the time. I mean, it's we all know the stealing is wrong, but he said, like, hey man, there's some money. All we gotta do is take it. Well, right. I, I will I say mean, I, I think I, we're I inviting why, trouble every day we open for big deal. Why why are they requiring people to buy food? It's not like they're gonna be eating that in a car either, right? No, I, mean, I think that goes to Wendy's. You have to buy food that, and buy the if you wait, want the alcohol, you have to buy food. Yeah, that goes to Wendy's point. I think, okay, we're gonna do this and put the restaurant at risk and all this mayhem may result. But in the meantime, if you buy something, that'll help the restaurant out too. Hey, uh, Alvin, while, while you're with us, of course, you've been um, writing about sports for the St. Louis American for many years. And um, Tarasenko has asked to leave the Blues. He's pulling, I don't know, uh, he, he, uh, how many athletes have said that, that they want to be a traded away from St. Louis uh, with less than a minute to go? What are your thoughts? Well, what, I'm the Don King Sports Writer of the Year with the National Newspaper Publishers. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. I don't know what to think about that, Don King. <laughs> but no, hey, he wants out. There was, him and the Blues have been going round and round for about two years now, and maybe it's the coach. I don't know, but he wants out, and he's going to be a Kraken. He's going to go to Seattle. I don't think the Blues will protect him. They won't trade him, but he'll just be gone. Vladi Tarasenko's had a great run here. This is not about St. Louis. Every single city has athletes wanting in and wanting out. It's not a, it's very common. He's a professional athlete. And the idea that it should be about loyalty to a city, whatever, he's a professional athlete. And every city has professional athletes coming and going. It's no big, I mean, we're going to miss him. I think he's had a wonderful career here. His name should, his mm -hmm. number should be in the rafters. Maybe he's going to Charlotte with um, Michael Nidor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's all the time we have for this segment, everybody. Um, Alvin and Wendy will be talking to Dr. Mano Patri, who is the SSM Health Infectious Disease Specialist. The topic, the Delta variant, should be fascinating, and that's next on Donnybrook Next Up. We'll see you next week. Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. <laughs> And we welcome you to Donnie Brook Next Up. Alvin Reed and I are so delighted and honored to be welcoming to the program Dr. Manu Patry of SSM. She is an infectious disease specialist. And uh, there are so many questions about this, this new Delta variant. We're even hearing Dr. Patry about uh, something called a Lambda variant. So we do appreciate your time. Tell us what you were able to in layman's terms, because our viewers, where we don't have medical dictionaries, most of us, but but how, how would you describe the Delta variant? So what, the way to think about it with any virus, viruses mutate. That's how they stay alive. And many mutations are innocuous. They don't mean much. But there are mutations that start increasing um, the severity of, of that uh, virus to make it more potent. And so th this virus has mutated several times. And so what um, like the World Health Organization, CDC, et cetera, what they look at are what are the variants that could be of concern, VOC. So these variants of concern are an alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So alpha is the one that you've heard the UK strain um, they label that as the alpha. Then we've got our beta, um, gamma, 
and Delta, and the Delta is the latest with um, that was seen uh, originally in India. The potency of the Delta variant is the highest. So this has demonstrated to be the fittest of, of these strains. And what I mean by that is um, it ha it's much more infectious and potentially could be much more potent um, to people. And what you just need to do is take a look at how India um, has sustained such such horrific amounts of um, death and uh, morbidity associated with this uh, variant. Um, so that's why this is such a big deal of how rapid. Now, if you bring it home, now you can see that the Delta variant has now become the, uh, the predominant strain in the US. So there are different variants that are around, but what's the most common strain or the mo most available strain has now mutated into the Delta strain. It used to be the Alpha, the UK variant. Now it's the Delta. And that is a reflection of how, how quickly and how infectious this virus is. So for those of us who are, are vaccinated, um, should we fear? Um, are we gonna have to get another shot? Uh, just what does our future hold? It's a great question. So no medicine is without is 100%. No vaccine is 100%. The intent of the vaccine is trying to protect as many people in the population as possible. So I think one of the CNN commentators made a very good description. Think of the vaccine as a raincoat. And when you have a drizzle, it's, it well, it's well protected. When you have a thunderstorm or a hurricane, you start to see breakthroughs occur. The best um, action that we've got is vaccination. What we are seeing is that the people who are getting this Delta strain, the majority of these people who are getting sick and being hospitalized are those who are not vaccinated. We are seeing people who have been vaccinated who have acquired the infection but it is much less severe in general. But it is something that I think we all need to be more concerned about, especially in Missouri, as Missouri is now, um, you know, the top state of increasing cases in the country. So it's one of those that I'm like you, I'm vaccinated and I do feel safer and I do feel better. And I see COVID patients all the time. But I am aware that there are always going to be holes in any medication, especially if you keep having a virus that keeps mutating over and over again. Because we have to realize these vaccines were made at a at a stage where Delta vaccine, or the Delta variant, wasn't even didn't even exist. So the more variants that come out, the more challenge that may have to your vaccine. Um, so the question of booster is is sort of in a you have to think about it, I guess, in a couple of ways. One way to think about it is, do we will this vaccine have a durable amount of immunity? And right now, what we know is the Pfizer vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine have shown that it has um, actually quite an extensive durable immunity. The question is, though, what immunity to what? What strains? If you're having, um, as you mentioned, Kappa, Lambda, that potentially could be much more severe, the challenge may be that we may need another vaccine to combat the new strain that's available. And the way I would allude it to is like a flu shot. We get a flu shot every year. And that flu shot is based on what variants are out there in the community during that time period. So to try to best protect us. So it is possible we may need um, a, a it, this may be an annual thing. We just don't know yet. I, I have a follow-up on that and then another question, if that's okay, doctor. The follow-up yes. being when you say the, the level of severity is not what it is without the vaccine, does that still mean you're seeing people who have been vaccinated requiring hospitalization? Yes, much less, but yes. So it is possible um, and as we see, uh, but it is substantially less. We're talking... When you're looking at, um, if you've heard about how Southern Missouri, there's a huge outbreak, the majority of those people who are hospitalized are not vaccinated. So we are seeing some who are vaccinated, but not to the level of the unvaccinated um, people. 
The other question is, when we talk about these variants working our way up to the present, var the Delta variant threat, is this the way that the virus is almost trying to protect itself? Is, is, is so because the virus, we almost have to think of it like an advancing army, that it is trying to protect itself. So it is shape-shifting into all of, can you, can you address that a little bit, if you don't mind? It's what you, the way you described it is perfect. So the way to think about it is this, this virus doesn't want to die. And so it tries to get more and more clever. It tries to find ways to evade the immunity. So the more virus that's present, the more replication that occurs, the more mutations that occur. And those mutations can then increase potential risks for becoming more and more durable. So you have one set of army that's trying to you know, attack and it's not working. You change your tactics. You modify what you do to try to go after it a different way. Then you change it again. So viruses are incredibly clever and they do that. That's why even the flu, there are multiple variants of the flu that are run around. And um, that's why we are trying so hard to push for people to get vaccinated because the more people vaccinated, the less in virus present, the less this army can change its mind. We, we can try to quell this. You know, it's becoming to the point at this point where it's almost a preventable illness, you know, because, because of how significant um, what we're seeing in the communities of people who are vaccinated versus non-vaccinated regions. So, so the description of the army is perfect because that's exactly what, what it is. We're fighting an army that's ever changing. And, you know, everything you say makes perfect sense, okay? And, but your people aren't heeding that message. And it's, I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I mean, you have to see it and you have to think to yourself, how foolish, okay? And, and I, and then on, like I say, on, on my end, I, I say how foolish, and I'm starting to think I don't care. Um, tell me why I should why why should I not feel like that? So the way I think about it is um, information has never been so accessible as it has been in our day and age. There's a lot of power with that. It can be used for good or it can be used for not so good. Um, you know, we see this time and again where people um, who already have sort of a pre-existing concern or thought and they find somebody that seems like them, they follow that. So if somebody is concerned that they, their pregnancy or that they may not be able to get pregnant and they find an article that says that, they kind of go down that direction. Somehow, well, unfortunately, this virus has become politicized. And the problem that I think we need to realize is COVID doesn't care who you voted for. They could care less. They don't care about what state you're from. They don't care about any of that. All it wants to do is exist. And what we need to try to do is somehow remove the part where it's about removing people's rights or it's about a you know who you voted for and get down to the fact that this is a war. This is a war. Just like World War II, World War I, it, it doesn't take one person. It takes a village to, to survive this. And it does get very frustrating, and I would say it from both sides, because I have patients who still don't want to get vaccinated. And I'm trying to tell them, but this is actually the way to protect you. And it is trying to come into their mindset and understand it from their perspective to try to say, okay, you, this is how this is how the science works. It's not about politics. It's not about anything because this is in some areas. I mean, this is a very unpopular thing that I'm saying to get vaccinated. It is incredibly unpopular. And you and I, when we're talking about this, we're like, why would this be an unpopular statement? This is a way of protecting. We're trying to protect our kids. We're trying to protect our loved ones. Um, and so I think we, the, the part that I try to do is I try to still try to come at from their perspective 
to try to see if I can meet them in the middle and try to change their minds. And that's really, really hard. Um, because again, I think politics have come into this more than it should. If you're just joining us, welcome to Donnybrook Next Up. Our special guest tonight is Dr. Manu Patri. She is an infectious disease specialist with SSM Health. And we're talking about the Delta variant and uh, the fact that uh, Tokyo has, has declared a state of emergency. The Olympics will go on without fans uh, because of the lack of vaccinations in that country. Uh, do, does that surprise you, Dr. Patry, when you think of Japan's proximity to China and ground zero, you would think that there would be a sense of, of, of urgency to do all that you can because that part of the world, the Far East, Asia, they've, they've been through this. So that's kind of surprising. It, it, does that surprise you in any way? I think the way to think about it is there is a general mistrust with the government. You know, in, um, in Japan's history, they had a mass vaccination campaign of a different, for a different reason. And there were a lot of side effects that were seen with it. And that increased that concern in people's minds that they may not be able to trust the government. And so now what we're seeing are the effects of, of, all, of all of this because people are so hesitant to get this vaccine because of the concerns of perceived potential perceived side effects. And it's not, like you said, it's not just in Japan, but it's everywhere, even in India, where India is um, the number one uh, country for making vaccines for across the world. Their vaccination numbers were really, really low. So you're you're going against um, social concerns of lack of trust with government officials, um, inability to try to provide proper information to people. And then you see people then going to other avenues to try to get information. And that information may not be real. It may not be right. And so then you start fighting, having to fight that war. And so I'm not surprised to see because, you know, the Japanese like medical society was very against having the, the Olympics because of this concern. And there were all of these other factors that played a role. And I think rightly so not having, you know, thousands and thousands of people in a closed in stadium, even though it is, you know, heartbreaking because we love the Olympics, the question really comes down to is it's a safety thing and now they're sustaining sub substantial outbreaks outbreaks that we're seeing it sucks yeah. so in the united states along that similar uh pattern doctor uh black americans are vaccine hesitant and as i've pointed out on the show i i there, there's people of a certain age that are you know learned about are aware of what went on in tuskegee but younger people couldn't couldn't point to a map to tell where that university is so i kind of don't get that either i mean there could be mistrust of you know healthcare services but at the same time every statistical factor points to if you're a black person you should get vaccinated but yeah very lagging in numbers i'm not asking you for an explanation but that has to be heartbreaking too it is and i do i mean i've I, I totally understand, especially in the older population, um, the, the the mistrust. And that, again, goes into the social component, that people don't feel like they're being experimented on. You know, there's, there's the real social issues that are playing a role that are subsequently costing people's lives. So I've, I've had, I just had a 41-year-old who died recently, African-American woman, and it just hurts your heart. And it was um, sort of that perceived mistrust in where the vaccine and what that vaccine can do. And um, we are seeing it, and that's also why we're seeing it now a lot of younger people. Um, you know, that's where this new surge, there's a lot more younger people who are getting infected and are getting really sick from this. So I think that there's the component of mistrust. Also, they don't think it, it, it'll hurt them. 
There's also the thought of, okay, it's just a cold, you know, I should be fine, that kind of perception, which we need to get out because I had a 21 year old who had a stroke. I've had, you know, a 30 year old who died um, with complications from heart related post COVID. So these are real, you don't, we don't want you to learn afterwards. You know, a lot of the times, many of the people that I, uh, that I've treated who have gotten COVID, one of their biggest statements was, I wish I'd gotten my vaccine. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. Um, because uh, we have, you know, public service announcements still come on right now about smoking. And the, the, the point is they're showing how smoking wrecked their lives. And, you know, if you're going to do this, you know, you know they're, they're kind of horrific at times. Um, that, that has always seemed to be missing. Those stories like you just told that are bought, paid for, and put on national TV during national sporting events and the most watched shows, you know, between 7 and 10 o'clock Central Time. Um, I think, couldn't that help get the message across? Yeah, and, you know, the St. Louis Task Force actually um, did some, some of these where they had uh, families and survivors uh, talk. Um, this is a tough time because our public health um, departments have been decimated. Um, money has been taken away. Uh, so services have been removed. And so they have a fourth of their funds to do something that needs probably a billion more dollars than what they actually have available. But those are, you're right. I, I, I think the ones that where you see a normal person talk to you and say, this is what I had, or, and see what the side effects are, like the cancer patient who is smoking and has a tracheostomy, like those are significant. It's, again, I don't know if there's also a politics part of this, of why some of this information is not coming out. Because you do have people who don't believe that COVID is a thing, still. And so that is, that's a challenge, I think, of, of how to get the word out. How many millions of deaths, doctor? Today we reached a milestone. Was it four? Uh, I, I I I apologize. Maybe Anne Marie can can. I, I think it was it was it, millions. I mean, we're, we're we're millions and millions of deaths, and yet some people still think that we're just we're just talking about a cold, which is one of the reasons why the state of Missouri prominently mentioned in every national newscast um, with the summer vacation season upon us and, and people who have been vaccinated, uh, what do they need to know before they get on an airplane? Because that's the thing that the pockets of, you know, these hot spots, they're, they don't realize how they endanger the rest of the country and frankly, even the world. It doesn't sound like that, but we, we are very, we've never been more connected than we are today. So um, you have people getting on airplanes and, it, and then we're, we're off to the races. But, but parents of, of kids, let's, let's focus that, who are not vaccinated, what do they need to know before or if they even get on an airplane or in a station wagon? You're right. I mean, the way you're right, the way to think about it is, I mean, this virus we suspect originated in China and now it's affected the entire world. Our world is small. The Delta variant originated in India and now it's the number one strain in America. So this is, we are all connected. Um, what I think we, when you're talking about um, with kids who can't get vaccinated, I think the way to think about it again is, is that this fact, this variant is very infectious. Where, how much this plays a role onto our kids is still not known, but kids can get this. And what we don't know is, is the severity that it is to our children and whether or not this can transmit to others. So what I would say is, is that in these closed in spaces, such as airplanes, to the best of your ability, if you're able to mask you, yourself and your child, your child, um, and in closed-in areas, masking is one of the best ways still to try to protect the kids. And I think you know, airplanes know from many reasons, but they know that if they have an outbreak in their plane, no one's going on that airplane. So they're trying very hard as well to um, 
to keep people masked because to try to prevent it because it is a closed in area. So I would say in areas where there are closed tight spaces, masking is still worth it. And I know that people have this thing with masks, but we demonstrated we are capable of change. We did this. We were able to get our numbers down. And it was not because of one person. It was because of everyone. Everyone chipped in. And so, yes, it's not what you want, ideally. But this is a definite way to protect your fellow man, protect yourself. I, the fall semester will be here quickly. So especially, you know, at the elementary school level, uh, but, but at all, you know, schools, including colleges. Is this going to be kind of a, just a, the first few months, is it going to be a, I don't, I don't know how to put a scientific, not experiment, but very, watch very closely to see where the outbreaks are and if they are outbreaks and, and apparent, it's a pretty obvious it's going to be people who are vaccinated. But, you know, in your profession and CDC, are they already setting up to try to watch this as closely as possible? Absolutely. I mean, um, we all know, I, I, I'm a mom of three, and my kids did remote uh, schooling, and it was terrible. And, you know, they, <laughs> you know, I think that they liked it, I think. Mom's but, a doctor! <laughs> yeah, so, you know, my kids are going out, our kids are going to school, and we know that this is good for them. I think it is going to be closely watched because because of the challenges that we're going to be seeing with people who don't want to mask, we're going to be going into flu season. We're going to be, we're already in RSV season a bit. We're going to be not only challenged with COVID, but we're going to be challenged with other respiratory viruses. And so why we're trying to make this push so much for as many people as possible to get vaccinated now is that as we enter into the winter season, we try, we try as much as we can to minimize the potential damage that potentially could occur. But everyone is sort of watching with bated breath because we do want our kids back. We want our teachers safe. We want everyone safe. Um, but it is going to be a challenge because, you know, my, my kids go to a public school and, you know, the, it's a huge school. There's a lot of kids there. It is going to be a challenge in these closed in spaces of making sure that they're adequately protected. And my three children are vaccinated, but it's still not without the risk. I would still be saying, depending on how these numbers are looking, which I suspect they're going to be, I would have the mask um, at school because we don't know, um, you know, what the variants are going to be and we don't know how the numbers are going to be. Our executive producer and director, Anne Marie Berger, has has updated those numbers. There, There is a, a death toll worldwide of 4 million people have lost their lives because of COVID. And along those lines, Dr. Manu Patri, is there any, is, could there possibly be a worse time to be having the debate about healthcare professionals vaccinated or unvaccinated? Would you care to take this opportunity? You have the, you have the, the bully pulpit to, to speak to your, your colleagues who are reluctant? Yeah. So, you know, as you may have heard, um, you know, the major uh, St. Louis medical systems have been uh, have pushed towards mandating vaccinations. And there's a big reason for that. We know that we've seen the science that has demonstrated that these vaccines have been safe and they have proven to reduce the mortality and morbidity associated with COVID-19. It isn't, again, of the politics of this. This is a very unpleasant discussion to have because people are thinking we're trying to force the hands, we're trying to tell them what to do. We're missing, that's that's not the point. The point is, is that as we have already mandated influenza, we have seen that there. this is a safety to our staff. Our nurses, our janitors, our cooks are the most precious people in the entire world. They protect they're protecting the most vulnerable people of our population. They are golden, same as with our, doc our doctors. And we need to not only make sure we are protecting them, but we're protecting our patients. There was an outbreak uh, recently. Dr. Um, Patrick, I'm, 
I am so sorry, but we are, oh, we are rapidly, it, it oh, always okay. goes by much too quickly. Okay. Uh, you have you have been so very generous. I have a feeling we'll probably be asking her back, Alvin. So, Absolutely. Uh, uh, what a, what a, what a okay. wonderful guest. Well, it's a pleasure. It's such a, I, I love you too. So it's really an honor to meet oh, you guys. That's very dear. That's very dear. I grew dear. up in well, St. Louis. So like, oh, what, it's really cool it's for me. quite mutual. Dr. Manu Patry of SSM <laughs> Health System. She's an infectious disease specialist. Thank you all for watching. Thank this you. is Donnie Brook. Next up, stay tuned to 9 PBS. Good night. Donnie Brook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.